three. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. It was a nice light lunch. Temperature's gone up in the room, so mm. we can't have you full of too much starch just to keep you awake. I enjoyed my lunch anyway. Thank you to the Ritz. Um, so for this third panel, we're going to run things a little bit different to the previous panels, in that the previous panels were focused on achievements and accomplishments to date in the respective objectives um, and driver groups. This session is more of a, sorry to steal your concept, Tasha, but it's more of a talk to the experts kind of uh, chat show. Um, so our panellists up here, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves in a moment and tell you who you are as if they need to, but who they are and uh, which organisations and institutions they represent. And we're going to go through three questions. I want these guys to talk about in their respective areas, what are the lifelong learning opportunities that they see, what are the gaps and barriers that they see, and the final one, which is a big one, how do we drive forward an agenda of lifelong learning and a culture of lifelong learning? in the Cayman Islands and then we'll have 15 minutes for question and answers so we'll actually dedicate a bit more time to, to Q&A on this session. So I'm going to hand over to our panellists and I'm going to start at the end with Mr Roy Bodden if you could kick off and tell us a bit about who you are. Right, uh, I'm Roy Bodden and I'm the president of the University College of the Cayman Islands. I've been there now for just for three years, and uh, I'm excited. I'm excited, as excited now, about the University College as it was. When I came there, I think it's growing and dynamic, and uh, it certainly has a role to play in the developing and changing Cayman Islands. Thank you. Dr. Tash. Yep. My name is Dr. Tasha Ebanks Garcia. I am the president of the International College of the Cayman Islands. I've been there for five years. I'm also um, with the Wellness Center and the Passport to Success program, um, as well as Cayman 27. Let's talk to the experts. My name is Woody Foster, Foster's Food Fair, and I'm also representing life, not life in general, but literacy. <laughs> <laughs> literacy is for everyone, which is a new company by Rotary um, Sunrise. I'm Juliette Jufa, and I head up human resources um, at Dart Enterprises. Good afternoon and welcome. I represent the Ritz-Carlton Grand Cayman. I'm Jeanette Goodman, the human resources director here, and I've been in your lovely islands for four years and in the industry for 28. Thank you. Welcome. So let's kick off with the first question, and I'll go back to um, UCCI and ICCI. What are the opportunities that you see in your respective areas for lifelong learning? Well, if, if I'm to begin, the opportunities I see for lifelong learning are certainly unfolding as we progress forward. And I would say that the opportunities I'm beginning to see for lifelong learning is not so much in the traditional sectors now, but in new and opening areas which are mirroring trends in the developing world, i.e. they may not necessarily be opportunities uh, for things like accounting, business, to banking, international finance, to the same levels as there are now for new areas in science, engineering, and technology. And so these are the opportunities that we, these are the areas for which we have begun to root our students now because we believe that that is where there is a great future. And certainly, if, if we take as evidence the whole state of flux that international finance and money is in, I think that's a clear indication. Because if you follow trends in and developments in what is happening in information communications technology, uh, engineering, space travel, all the rest of it, that is where the future lies. Which is not to say that we've shut out the more traditional areas. Not so. But these are areas in which the competition is wide open for people who indulge in lifelong learning. So are we going to have a space travel program? 
Pardon? Are we going to have a space travel program well, here in Cayman? We see, we have an observatory, <laughs> and we've already had a conference in which we talked about interstellar travel, so we'll see what happens. I like that kind of futuristic thinking. Thank you. Dr. Tasha, for you. Yeah, I think one of the opportunities that, that we're ripe to explore right now is greater collaboration between education and private and public sector in terms of promoting lifelong learning. So it's not simply looking at learning as a degree that begins and ends, but continued professional development over the course of one's career. One of the things that we've been exploring at ICCI is partnering with the private sector in particular in developing professional development courses that are designed for the unique needs of the respective organization. Um, some of these revolve around soft skills training that traditional degree programs may not cover. Others are around deficits that are seen in the workplace, whether it's related to literacy or numeracy, so that education is not just for those who are pursuing degrees, but education is open and available and accessible to all, and it's being tailored to the organizations, to the needs and the demands of, this partic of particular organizations. Thank you. Woody. Um, well, for me, opportunities for um, you know, is is endless because f for me it's it's from within and it's not just a, a bricks and mortar education or it's not online or you know, certification or whatever. It it can be from within. if if you don't have the ability or you know whether it's financial or time or whatever to get an education, whether it's online or you know, through traditional means. You can still learn on the job, or you can learn whatever it is that you're doing by, by other means. It's really what's burning from within you to actually excel. And I think that's one of the issues that we have in this country is that that, that burning is not, is not there. And how do, we, how do we address that situation? Because we can talk about all of the education that we want, but if the, if the young people or the older people, for that matter, aren't willing to actually push forward, we're going to forever have this problem. I guess to answer that question, um, I'll, I'll segue a little bit into some of the uh, what I think are challenges or, or barriers, and that is I think there are a lot of different opportunities within lifelong learning. But however, one of the things that we have to do as a community is to look at things in non-traditional ways. I think there are a lot of people that think about learning as, well, it's got to be sitting in a classroom, it's got to be learning. Um, that's what learning is about. And as Woody said, there are a lot of other learning opportunities that are available just working along with someone um, at, you know, in, in a work environment that provides and presents learning opportunities. And it's just really changing perceptions. Um, and it's across the ages, starting from our young people. And we, we try to get young people in on internship programs, um, pairing them up with our employees. Um, all the way through to people that are at or nearing retirement age, um, across the, the sort of middle of the um, you know sort of middle of the career folks, a lot of whom would like to do something else, but they're not quite sure what it is they want to do. So it's just really for me the opportunities, as Woody says, are endless. But one of the challenges we have is just changing perceptions about what learning is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Janet. I would also echo um, what Woody said. I think it begins with self-motivation. You could have the bricks and mortars, the books, the opportunities there, but if I'm not motivated to take advantage of them, then it doesn't matter. Within the Ritz-Carlton organization, we have a service value that talks about learning and growing, and we encourage our ladies and gentlemen and our leaders to constantly taking opportunities to partner, as Juliet said, with someone else on a project, to do lateral service, to learn from what they do in housekeeping to how it impacts someone in the front office. But as an organization, Ritz-Carlton, Merritt International, Hyatt Weston, we open the world because you can travel and learn and see and do, but if you travel without really opening up yourself to those new opportunities, it truly is a waste of time. And not to knock my own 
country being a US citizen, one of those countries with a limited number of people holding a passport that takes them out of the country. We try to replicate the US when we go. We want our hamburgers and, and certain things. And I really implore younger people, especially, to throw off those, those um, mantles from our parents and our culture and really open yourself up to what the world offers. And through hospitality, we literally are everywhere. And when you have that space program, Mr. Bodden, we'll put a hotel up there. <laughs> So I, I take on board one of the, the challenges, and we'll get to gaps and, and challenges in a, in a moment. Um, but when I think one of the interesting points you raised is around how we motivate our, our youngsters, um, or any age, um, to learn and to continue the lifelong learning. It's about educating those individuals around what lifelong learning is, because it's hard to get motivated if you're just told, well, get on and learn, be a lifelong learner. But actually, if you give permission to employees or to the school leavers to say, okay, it's not just about putting your bum in a seat and go into a training program. That's not learning. It's how you apply it when you come back. And to your point of the programs that you have at the Ritz-Carlton, it, it clearly outlines what lifelong learning is. It's about putting yourself on a stretch assignment, putting yourself on a project that's outside of your area. And I think if people haven't been educated that that's available to them, then they can't be motivated. So I think we have quite a large part to play in that. We, it's got to be a, um, a partnership. We can't just say, well, they've got to get more motivated. It's hard to get motivated if they don't understand what the opportunities are. But good points, thank you. I'm going to swing right back down to the other end and look at some of the, the challenges that you, you face at UCCI and ICCI. I think one of the main challenges we face in a society like the Cayman Islands, which is what I call a credentialized society, in that people equate education with a credential, a degree, a certificate, a diploma. So we credentialize to the point where those persons who are not academically inclined feel that they are at a distinct disadvantage, which brings them to the position where when they come to college, college level, they want to go into programs that they believe is going to bring them recognition and prestige when they may not have the aptitude and the skills to tackle those kinds of programs. So what we found was that people kind of shy away from the more technical aspects and the more hands-on aspects and areas and want to get into the white collar, what is it pretty prestigious. Let me give you a case in point about a student. And I think we may have lost the student, although I tried to save the student. I got a call one day from a parent mother saying that I should try to talk some sense into her son because he wanted to study marine engineering, which he wanted him to go into accounting. And I, I knew the parent and I knew the son. I said, I don't think I can be of much assistance to you, madam, because I know your son, and I also know that he's old enough and responsible enough to know what he wants to do. Well, I just think that there's no you know, future in that and that, that he should go into accounting because... I said, ma'am, I, I, will, I, will, I will, as a courtesy to you, speak with your son. I'm not going to try to persuade him. I just want to ascertain if he is aware of his responsibilities, the decision he has taken, and the consequences of that decision. And so I spoke to the young man, and he said, I'm quite aware, and I'm not changing. I, I don't see him at the college any longer. And I tried to make contact with him a couple of times. Good. I think in many cases in Cayman, we make parents and persons in positions of responsibility and authority make that kind of, that's a fundamental mistake. The other case to that was significantly easier to, to handle. I a similar complaint about a lady who wanted her son, he wanted to go into engineering technology. She wanted him again to go into business management. Well, I persuaded her, he's doing well in engineering technology, the young man wants to be an engineer. And so, first of all, we have to navigate this challenge of any learning is valuable. So that's what we have to instill. That's a fundamental principle that we have to instill. Once you have to think 
the second obstacle that I come across. When I ask my students, what do you want to do? Many of them say, why do you want to do this? Or I want to go into this area because this is where the big bucks are. Mm -hmm. This is where I can make money. So we have to dispel that notion of going into something just for the big bucks. I ask a simple question. Do you like what you're going into? Yes, I do. Then if you like what you're going into, by all means, go and go to the nth degree. But if you're just going into something just because that's where the big bucks are, chances are you won't be a success and you'll drop out at the first available mile post after you've passed where you think you want to be and then lifelong learning ceases at that point. It ceases. So we've, we've, we've got to let them understand. Understand that they should pursue something not because they can make a lot of money but because they have an interest in it or they believe they can make a contribution to that be it technical, vocational, or academic. Thank you. Dr. Tasha. <clears throat> um, earlier we heard that 49% of students got five level two passes or more. And I think, and it was said that we need to focus on the upward trend, and I agree that we need to focus on the upward trend, we need to celebrate the upward trend, but I think we would be doing our students a disservice if we didn't acknowledge and recognize that that meant that 51% didn't. Um, and that five years ago, 73% didn't attain those passes. And they're now 21, 22 years old, and they're either looking for higher education or they're looking for the workforce. What this means for us, at ICCI is that we have a number of students coming to our institution who do not have the necessary foundation to successfully matriculate through higher education. In September, 54% of students, new students that we admitted, do not have five or more passes. They do not have the necessary foundation. They would not get into a school outside of this island. Their option is UCCI or ICCI. And I'm glad that they have those options because it means that there is a second chance for them like SciFec is now a second chance. We are also second chances for these individuals. However, what it means is that we've had to, at ICCI, we had to develop a new program, a new department. In September, we opened our student support services department, hired a director. We have literacy labs, numeracy labs, peer tutoring program. None of it was factored into our operational budget, um, and so I'm trying to find the money for it, and eventually I know that I, in faith that I will, because we have a social responsibility to support these individuals. Those who are, who are not graduating, or, and until we have graduation standards in 2014, we're going to have hundreds of students out there who need our support. They need UCCI, they need ICCI, and they need us to come equipped with the support mechanisms in place to help them matriculate through. Um, we have ICCI instructors in this room today who I've spoken to who have said, you know, I don't understand. Why don't they understand basic? They don't have the basic numeracy skills. They're struggling in accounting. But it's because they didn't graduate with a CXC in math or in accounting, but they're pursuing an accounting degree. And we need to provide them with that support. There is a cost, a financial cost for us, and I think as a community, we all need to pull together to, to bear that cost to support these students. Um, the other thing that we need to look at is educational accommodations for special education needs at the tertiary level. There's been a lot of work done around special education needs at the primary and secondary level. And one of the drivers that I was a part of with the National Strategic Plan for Education looked at ensuring that in the primary and secondary level accommodations were made, that there were opportunities for assessment so that these students could be successful. There needs that, that needs to be taken a step further. There needs to be recommendations then at the tertiary level so that we're ensuring that when they leave secondary school, there are also accommodations in place, there's support in place. I've been in conversation with Shannon Seymour, the director of the Wellness Center, to put together an assessment package for our students. Because while I, as a psychologist, will look at some of our students and I can identify a number of them bearing symptoms of learning disorders, they were never formally diagnosed. And so technically, in an institution of, of tertiary education, we shouldn't be giving accommodations without the assessment. 
but these students have made it through without ever being identified. They were what we talked about in an earlier session, kind of those that are in the middle, that are, that are doing well, they're getting C's and B's, and they're, they're getting by, um, but they're, they're undiagnosed learning disorders, and they're getting to higher education, and it's getting harder and more challenging. And so hopefully through the work um, partnering with the Wellness Center, we'll be able to have an assessment package that we can then have our students assessed and provide accommodations for them. So I think those are the two things that, that I see as kind of gaps that need to be addressed. Thank you. Woody. Um, well, I'll leave the education side to the edu <laughs> educators. Um, from, the, from the workforce side, there, I think there's a, a, trend, a tremendous amount of gaps out there. And there's, uh, I think we all, or, or most of us, would recognize that there's a, a big issue with the education um, side of things here in Cayman and, and what it is turning out to entering the workforce. I certainly see it in, in my business. And I'd like to be the, the first person here to raise my hand and say we as a business have failed um, our, our Caymanians in that from the standpoint of we have a business to run and we have to make sure that we open the doors at 7 and we close at 11, six days a week. And it's, there's no excuse for not doing that because when you come into my store, I need to perform a job. You've come to, to spend your money and I need to perform. So people showing up late, people show, are not showing up at all, it's not acceptable. So we go out and if, if we can't find a Caymanian, we go out and, and get a work permit. And our work permits have grown tremendously to where we're probably, I think right now we're at about 70, 30 expats to Caymanians. And you all see it in the blogs and hear about it and you come in there and you see a sea of, well, it's Filipinos or Indians or whatever the case may be. But I have a business to run. So, you know, we say, I've given them an opportunity, they didn't take it, that's not my problem, that's their problem. I go out and hire a work permit. Well, from looking from within as an individual and as a company, but well, we've failed. Um, and that's just, just simply not, not good enough. So when I sit on this panel and talk about life, um, life learning, and what can we as a company do to, to affect that, we, I don't think we can simply say anymore, I have a business to run, I need people to run it, and if you don't come to work, I'm going to terminate you and I'm going to get a work permit who I know is going to come to work. Well, that's not good enough. We need to put more money behind, not simply, not simply training, because anybody can put in training. Again, if they don't show up to the training, you've done your job, they didn't come, well, so there you go. We need to figure out within the business community, whether it's my job, whether it's my company, a law firm, an accounting firm, how do we address the situation of not doing what my company has been doing and probably all of yours to be perfectly honest. How do we address that? How do we become a part of, this, of the solution to try harder? If somebody, if you've given them two chances and that's your limit, well maybe you go to three. How do you, how do you up the ante on your training program to actually retain the at-risk kids because you know when they come into your doors you can see it they're going to fail you know that but that's not good enough to allow them to fail how can we go further and i think if we can develop a culture within all of us to get past what we've done in the past maybe we can start changing some of the numbers in terms of how do we retain more caymanians and actually drag them along kicking and screaming to actually make them better people Woody, that's great points, and thank you. And um, I'm going to introduce you to your competition, which is Kirk Supermarket. <laughs> um, you, you missed the presentation um, earlier, and I think you, what you've talked to is, is so fascinating because what we heard was a success story at Kirk Supermarket where they've been actually able to up their figures from 17% Caymanian to now 45%. And that was through using one of the tools that we've, we've showcased through the Develop Talent um, Driver Group, which is Work Keys and Career Ready. So we'll hook you up with Brendan uh, Malice. Where, yep, that's Brendan over there. Uh, and, and that's one tool that can, can help you address some of these issues because they're valid issues. And um, I'm proud of you for saying, you know, you guys need to take a bigger role in that because it's two-way and it's in a, in it's a partnership. So thank you. Not usually known for political correctness. So <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Willie. Juliet. 
Um, I would say that um, some of the gaps are, are the um, barriers that we have. I, I happen to work within an organization that certainly recognizes the importance and value of lifelong learning, and so I'm very um, pleased and proud to, to be there. Um, one of the things that we're doing is really looking at our learning and development programs um, and developing those and seeing where we can um, capitalize on those opportunities. But some of the challenges that we see um, in working with, with employees across our group, um, one of the biggest challenges that we have are just time constraints and other personal constraints that employees have. Um, a lot of employees are working full-time jobs um, very, in very busy roles. Um, some of them have family commitments, and so it's just finding the time to continue that lifelong learning, um, which sort of goes back to my previous point on changing the perception of what lifelong learning entails. And it's not just about sitting in a classroom, but it can also be um, mentoring within the workplace. It can be working along across disciplines within the workplace. Um, and so just trying to find ways to, um, to, to get around that. I would say the other challenge that we have um, is despite the, um, the efforts that, that all of the institutions locally, educational institutions locally, um, are making, uh, you know, I, I think that there are some limited opportunities in terms of both programs and programming. We've heard from the educators that learning, people learn in different styles, we have different challenges in terms of how people learn. And so just having the, a variety of learning opportunities available. Um, it, there are a lot of needs that are being tackled right now in terms of what's needed within um, workplace, within the education system. There's a whole other opportunity out there um, that has to do with leisure learning that you know we, we can take advantage of. Um, and the other, I think, challenge that we have is within a lot of organizations, I don't think that, that we do a good job of recognizing employees when they do make the effort to continue that learning and to, you know, whether it's going into a classroom situation and getting a degree or whether it's, um, you know, getting a certificate or whether it's participating in some sort of mentoring program is just acknowledging um, and letting them know that that is valued. Thank you. Janet. Uh, one of the biggest gaps or barriers is, is from our uh, perspective is self-motivation. We really believe uh, when we hire people, we're looking for people who are motivated, who are willing to work with people and enjoy that. If they don't, then it's really a bad fit. But some of the things that we find when um, hiring um, local um, Caymanians and, and um, the younger generation, is they don't know how to problem solve. And I think it's not a Caymanian situation. I think it's a generational situation. You know, growing up, my mother would say, go outside and find something to do. And being a mother, I'm actually buying her the things I hope that she'll play with in order to have fun. So I've taken away that, that creativity that I had with a box and a string and a rock and a brother, you know. <laughs> I had four. Go, I had four <laughs> sisters who helped hoist that rope. Um, but you know, I, I see that I do it for her, and it's. Um, she said to me the other day, and I've had conversations with um, a couple of women in the room. Is I don't tell you things, Mom, and I said why? Because you'll do something about it. Of course I will. I'm an action-oriented problem solver. My daughter is someone who will just say, no, it's okay, it'll go away. But that's a generational thing, and it's not just the 12-year-olds out there. I'm working with 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds who also, I've had their mother call when they can't find their paycheck. I, I really need the employee to come. We do see a literacy barrier. Um, uh, we do a lot of lineups and communication where people read and when English is your first language and you struggle reading third and fourth grade level English, it's a concern because their ability to rise, which is the ultimate goal, will be inhibited by that. Um, commitment. Now, they need to want to work and are willing to work. Um, we don't close at 11 o'clock at night. We're open seven days a week and, and Christmas. 
and your birthday, and people have to understand that. You know, <coughs> um, Thanksgiving was a U.S. holiday yesterday, but I was here, you know, till six, and um, I was carving turkey and I was working. And uh, but that's you. You give up things when you become employed. And I think the biggest one, honestly, is the desire. Their desire is to get the house, the car, the stuff, but they don't know they have to work for it anymore because again, being a good mom, I'm buying her the stuff. <laughs> you know, she has a list of chores and if she's almost got them done, I still give her, uh, well until this year, I still give her the allowance. And, and we're creating this problem for, for other employers. You know, when we talk lifelong learning, I have an example in my life of my grandfather. He was a tradesman, this Mr. Bodden talked to earlier. He, everything he learned, he learned in a book. He graduated high school and didn't go any further. When he had his heart attack, and I was a nursing student, and yes, I didn't, st I didn't stick with the program, <laughs> he borrowed my book on anatomy and human um, physiology and learned about the heart and read about it so when he met with his physician, he could speak about really real information and learn what went wrong and how can he avoid it. So I think, yes, businesses have a responsibility and an obligation and we met with um, the workforce development um, department and they have a new aptitude test that we're excited to uh, see how that helps. But we also need as parents and and committee uh, members and teachers and, and community, uh, we need to encourage our younger generations to take responsibility for what they're doing. It's, mom's not always gonna be there to say, Miss Goodman, my son didn't get his paycheck. It's like, why are you calling me a week later? Where was your, he's been here every day. You know, they need to be able to be held accountable. That's no, very interesting because I don't feel so bad now about not letting my children have PlayStation because I'm just I know you carry on drawing and coloring and my husband's yeah. an educator and we argue constantly about the need for cursive writing mm -hmm. and he says look by the time our kids graduate they won't need to handwrite everything will be done on the iPads and all this technology and I argue that we're building skills in my five-year-old and six-year-old that develop different abilities as as they grow yes okay they might not need to have beautiful examples. Those, those are your children <laughs> saying. <laughs> <laughs> we want the PlayStation Club. <laughs> they might not need to have beautiful handwriting, but it develops a certain skill in the brain as we develop mm -hmm. as a youngster, going back to Steve's point on the developmental milestones. That is quite important. These educators down here are going to disagree with me later. But anyway, moving on. So, uh, yep, yeah, okay. And um, on to our final question. And I'm going to go back to Mr. Mr. I Ross. just want to make a, a, an important point before you make a final question. Yes. You know, one of the things that we have to really begin to give some serious thought to as parents and educators is this whole notion of, particularly the students now, how can we better utilize technology in their learning processes? Because they're experts. But mm -hmm. well, we have some challenges because the CXC examination syndicate found out that poor grades in English usually emanate from a couple of things that has to do with what the children use. They use their technology and in, 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 in them uh, beeping, BBMing and all that, they abbreviate <laughs> words and so they don't know how to spell. Neither is their English tenses properly. And so that is what is happening now. If we could find a way to get to inculcate in them somehow that, of course, it's all right to use these shortcuts, but there are circumstances when you have to going to be able to manifest expertise in the real thing. So when you get on an examina in an examination setting, it can't be Y-O-U being you. <laughs> letter of the alphabet, you know? Um, because uh, I've watched them perform. They can solve any kinds of complicated problems with their technology. But if you take the technology from them, they're exactly the basic skills of problem aren't there. Not there. And so we have to that's a challenge for us as educators and problem parents. But we're gonna have a situation like Terminator where the machines take over. Mm -hmm. Beware. <laughs> I'm with you. Okay, final final question for the panelists. 
um, and then we'll move to question and answer. So given the challenges that you've talked about and the opportunities that you've talked about, how do we move Cayman forward um, in terms of getting lifelong learning on the agenda? Our most formidable <coughs> challenge has to do with attitude change. It has to do with attitude. We have to find a way to change the attitude that achieving the minimum is good enough. And that's, that's the single most common complaint, most important point that I have encountered. People have to understand, for example, we, we tell our students who are involved in degree programs, no longer is a bachelor's degree good enough. That's just entry level stuff. Now if you're not into graduate school, masters and beyond, you're not saying anything. For those persons who are not academically oriented, who may be skills oriented or vocational oriented, they have to be prepared to engage in a continuing, continuous process, if not formal learning, either apprenticeships, exploring, challenging, this kind of thing, because it's no longer good enough to just say, aha, I have arrived, now that I've completed my baccalaureate. Let me just sit back now and break in. Because science is changing, the way we do things are changing, so it stands to reason what I learned five years ago may not even be applicable now. So it's necessary to begin on a continuous process. It's a treadmill now in which we enter. We, we should not think about alighting until the end of our lives. Thank you. Dr. Tasha. Um, there's three points that I'd like to make. The first being that we need to look at creating educational programs that meet the needs of the 21st century learner. Um, one of the things that we are, are doing some research around and we're excited to experiment with next year is the flipped classroom, which has been being used in other jurisdictions. What we're looking at doing, one of the challenges that we have, our students are mature students for the most part. They work full time, they come to school full time, they have families full time, and they have challenges meeting what we define as the academic requirements in order to pass a class. The, the biggest challenge they have is reading the textbook, and we keep saying as academia, well, you have to read the textbook, and they say, yeah, but exactly when in my day would I have time to read the textbook? And so one of the things that we're exper experimenting with in the flipped classroom is having the instructor tape record lectures around the textbook material because the, tech, the theory is fundamental. We need to cover that. So they videotape those lectures and students have an opportunity at their leisure to, to view or listen to those lectures. Viewing and listening is a lot easier than sitting and reading. You can multitask and do other things at the same time. So that when they come to class, they've already processed the material that's in the textbook through this lecture and they're able to then engage in dialogue and discussion and application and case study and, and really kind of chew up the material and go through it. Um, so we're looking at that, um, doing some research around that in the coming quarter and experimenting with one of our classes um, and looking also developing focus groups with our students to look at other ways that we can adjust the delivery of our product so that it meets the demands of them as, as learners in this 21st century. The other thing that we're looking at is increasing the way that we integrate the practical with the theoretical in order to prepare our students more adequately for the workplace. The theoretical is important, but when you get to the workplace, a lot of it is the practical that's missing. Those practical skills are lacking. And so we really want to make sure that there is a balance between, between those to ensure both their educational and professional success. And if, they can, if we can do that, I, I'm confident that they're gonna see a direct correlation between their degree and their work. So many people, they get a degree and then they go to work and nothing in that degree is used on the job and so they can't see the value of that degree to the workplace but if we can connect it through practical application as well as theoretical the correlation will be there and they will be lifelong learners because they'll see the intrinsic value of that degree um, the third thing that we're working on and I think is important is increasing the cooperation and partnership between businesses and educational institutions and between educational institutions um, to that end one of the organizations that we 
are, are partnered with and working heavily with is the Cayman Island Society of Professional Accountants. And we've, I've asked CISPA if they would, would partner with us in a way that they would help to guide our educational institution as a stakeholder and provide input, input in regards to our syllabus for our accounting program, helping us with gap analysis. We are teaching students for you to employ them. But if we don't know what it is you're looking for, your in, for in your employees, how can we teach them and prepare them for you? And so in sitting with, with CISPA and looking at our syllabi and looking at our program and doing gap analysis in ensuring that our program is designed around the needs of the workforce, we are better preparing our students to be successful and ensuring that what you get in the end is what you're looking for. Um, we've also, Philip Scott of the National Workforce Development Agency and I have, have for the past couple of months been in conversation looking at how ICCI as an institution can assist them in the work that they're doing in helping to prepare and develop the skills in those their clients who don't who lack the skills um, for the workforce. Um, I said to, to Robin of, of SciFac, we need to sit down and talk. How can our institutions support each other? What can we do at ICCI to support the work that you're doing? You're looking at a further education unit. We have, we have further education programs. We're a school of higher education. How can we work together so that we're not always reinventing the wheel, we're not duplicating efforts, but we're collaborating and working together. Um, I've spoken with Clifton Hunter looking at having some of our instructors go out there and do some work on a volunteer basis with, through their life skills program so that students are getting exposed to higher education when they're in high school to get them excited about what's, what's yet to come so that high school is not the end. Um, so there's lots of opportunities, I think, but it, it, it's going to take lots of collaboration. And I think if we all work together and support each other in this endeavor, a lot more could be done. I'd like to hand out one of, of each of those six action items and blast it to the audience. <laughs> Let's get going. I'm motivated. OK. Um, Woody, Juliet, and Janet, uh, Janet, we've got about three minutes, so let's divvy that up. <laughs> yeah, I Woody. To talk, so you're, you're good to um, I think the word entitlement is an issue for us in, in Cayman, mm -hmm. and whether that's the, the mom that's buying too many Xbox for their kids, <laughs> or whether it's um, parents at home telling their kids, well, you're Cayman, so you don't need to try quite as hard. And I know that's a myth, and that one is debatable all over the place, but. Um, the word entitlement, I think, is a, is a big issue. Um, nothing in this world is promised to you. Um, so I'll, I'll lead on from entitlement to work ethic. Um, I think we need to teach in our kids that if they have a strong work ethic, they can achieve just about anything. Um, as I as lead on to my first point uh, from the first question, you don't necessarily have to have a degree to excel in life. If you have a, a strong work ethic, you can achieve a lot of things. Um, but you can also apply your work ethic to your higher education. So either way you look at it, a strong work ethic would achieve a lot. And I think that's another thing that's lacking here in Cayman that all of us can help to, um, to deal with. Um, I read a document that Will Pino sent me the other day on, came from Guernsey. Um, and they had asked a, an economic group or company to, to do some, some work for them on, on workplace. And I think they came up with 31% of their employees they felt were, were below par on skills. So 69% were at par or above in terms of their skill level. And almost none of those employers talked about literacy and numeracy. And if that same company were to come here and do that analysis here in Cayman, what would we find? Um, so again, I think there's a, there's a lot of situations that, that, we need to, that we need to do here. And I don't think there's a silver bullet to solve the problem. It comes from, from all of us. It comes from the moms. It comes from us in the work, workforce. It comes from the coaches, because those coaches spend a lot of time with your kids. And they see and hear a lot of things that you don't. Um, so we need to put energy behind them, our teachers. Any of the change, any of the people that have anything to do with change, I think we need to spend time with those individuals or groups. Mm -hmm. And we need to talk about entitlement. We need to talk about work ethic. Thanks, Woody. As the primary caregiver, my husband has to be accredited here. So not just the mums, but the dads too. Thank you. Okay, Julia. 
Um, to add to Woody's comments, I would say, again, back to my original point, changing perceptions um, in terms of what life lear lifelong learning is, that it's not just about the textbook learning or the classroom learning. It's not just enough to have a degree. Um, we all know that successful people in business aren't those people that just know their jobs, but they have the other softer skills as well. And so um, letting our employees and our young people understand that those things are important as well and giving them opportunities to develop those areas. Thank you. Um, and also another point that I just want to make quickly is, you know, helping, helping people, helping within our community, within our, our businesses, understand the value of lifelong learning. Um, and sometimes some of the discussions that we're having um, within our business and also just from a community perspective is sometimes in order to understand the value of something, an individual has to participate, whether it's in the cost or has to, has to do something, has to make some sort of a contribution to really appreciate the value. Um, and that's one of the things mm -hmm. that I think you know, we, we maybe could spend some more time thinking about. Thanks. Janet. Simply good, being good in Cayman isn't good enough. Hmm. Our students, our generations, young or old, need to stri strive to be the best, and we're global. So being good in Cayman will be good o enough today, but it is not good enough tomorrow. Thank you. Some great comments, great remarks. So I'm going to hand it over now to the audience. And anybody who's joined, I'm just going to refresh you on the rules I set this morning. If you have a question, please put your hand up. And please make sure it's a question, not a statement. And please make sure it's succinct and to the point. And panelists will do the same in their answers. Let's go. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> She's tough. That's a threat. <laughs> <laughs> you don't respond to well to threats. <laughs> Uh, this one is for Mr. Borden. Could you please elaborate on what are the available programs in, at UCCI on science and technology, and what are your plans for other programs? Okay, currently we have started an associate degree in engineering technology, which with our articulation agreements with the universities, in the U.S. will likely lead our students to a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering, not professional certification, Bachelor of Science. And notwithstanding the restraints that everybody has now, we are looking, astronomy was taught at the University College years ago, so we are resuscitating astronomy and you'll be teaching astrophysics come uh, September, God willing. So we are looking to broaden our program. There are some other initiatives which may not necessarily be leading <coughs> to degrees, but we are adding as we go along. We want to start a program in robotics, which is what we are investigating currently. And that's it. That is, uh, completely different aside from the nursing program which, which we're developing. Yeah. Any other questions? Just don't have I just have another question, which is on a different line from this one, which is, uh, Mr. Woody Foster mentioned several times that there is no burning desire for learning, that uh, the attitude towards work is negative. So I would like to know is, if anybody in the audience has any idea, really, why is that? Is it the question of compensation of the workers? How, how people feel about the compensation they are receiving in the job? Is it about the job satisfaction itself? Because you might be packing shelves every day and not doing anything else, but just packing shelves, and maybe has a desire of doing something else. So, uh, and what is the private sector doing about these things too? I'd like to actually ask if we can pass the microphone over to Ahisha. Sorry, I know you've had your time on the panel, um, but it's a very good question, I think. Ahisha, you've dealt with some of these issues in terms of motivation and career progression, and you are also working in a market where the market value that's paid to the, to the role is lower. So can, can you answer that question? Would you mind? I think it, um, is this working? 
Okay, I think it goes back to uh, what you create within your organization as far as your organizational culture. And, and for instance, at Kirks, we have a culture of training and development and learning. And when you establish that as a business culture and you facilitate that and you work towards that and you create programs that all connect to that, um, and then you have employees working and benefiting from those programs, it improves morale and it um, elevates their interests. And as a result of that, you'll see more committed, dedicated employees that have value that goes beyond just receiving their paycheck. One of the great initiatives I saw personally when I was shopping, and I shop at all of the supermarkets, I'm not, I don't discriminate, Hurley's, Kirk's and Foster's, um, but when I was at Kirk's one of the days, uh, one of the guys that was stuck in the shelves had a note on his shirt that said, ask me what my goals are today. And I asked, and this was just a great way of getting these guys to feel connected to the customer, feel that their job had more value than just I'm going to stock this. Um, and so there, there are great ideas. We have great talent out there in our organizations doing some of these things already. So um, thank you for that information. Any other questions? These are questions, right? OK. Thank you. Hi. Hello. I appreciate the, the panel's uh, honesty, by the way. You've uh, dealt with some tough issues. Um, with some problems that have been mentioned is the entitlement, uh, work ethic problem, problem solving, reading, writing skills. Um, and I appreciate we look at industry or higher level universities to, to solve some of these problems or to address them. But my question is, shouldn't these things be taught in elementary or high school? There, there's a good book out there, for example, that says everything I learned, I learned in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And, and for next year, maybe, I, this is one question, but uh, as a proposal next year, I'm curious to hear from the principals of the high schools, because that's one side I don't see. Where is the problem? What is the problem in the high schools, in the elementary level? Because in my opinion, all these things we've mentioned should be being taught in the families and at that level. Personally, everything I learned, I learned in reality. Everything real I learned, I learned at home or in kindergarten or in elementary. Everything else has been maybe different types of skills, it's a, but it's not a good, this stuff. It's a good question, and I think it was touched upon throughout the other panels as well in terms of the work that's happening now at early childhood. We won't see reflected. There's a gap, and Dr. Tasha talked about up until 2014, she's going to be handling the issues that she highlighted. But there is hope that the initiatives that we've started with early childhood, with uh, the middle schools, the SciFec, will start to impact what Dr. Dr. Tasha is seeing. So I think we've actually addressed that, unless there are any other comments. Can, can I say something, Tom? Mm -hmm. I, I'm very familiar with, with, with uh, entitlement, the entitlement culture, entitlement mentality. The exact opposite of that is a theory called relative deprivation. And that's why I say this, this whole question on the lives, how it should change. You, Look, I'll be frank with you. When I looked in this room, I didn't see any people that I was expecting to see. People I see here are all doing well and would have done well. So I asked myself, and Dr. Tasha asked me what I was thinking about, well, the, the people we need to help, with all due respect, are not here. Are not here. We are preaching to the choir. We are preaching to the converted. So if you ask these people, what's your problem? They say, why should I? I'm not going to get the job anyway. Why should I excel? Why should I do this? Why should I? I'm not going to get it anyway. They're going to follow me. That's what we have to work at. As a sociologist, I can tell you, we better make effect the change. Because if the change affects itself, we won't like the way it affects us. Thank you. There were other questions. That's why I said your question was a great question. Um, if, if we consider that lifelong learning is a function of the ability to learn and the motivation to learn, um, and if there, if, if there are people who are currently in the workforce that may not have acquired those skills, um, we're talking about lifelong learning, it, it appears to me that perhaps through the early childhood uh, initiatives and so on, that we will be given those people coming in the future the kind of skills that they might require for lifelong learning. 
I'm just wondering whether the panel has got any, any ideas in terms of what we do for the other ones. Uh, those, the 25 year old right now might not have those, uh, that motivation uh, to, to, to learn more. Maybe has just managed to get a job or something. Where are they going to be in 20 years time uh, when the world may be a completely different place? Uh, where the jobs that they've got skills for today, those jobs may, will definitely not be existing. Totally different sort of jobs around. If they haven't got lifelong learning skills that will enable them to transition to new types of employment, what are we going to do? I just wonder if the panel has any ideas or comments on that. Did you get that? And who would like to answer? Well, um, it is, it, that's, a, that's difficult, obviously. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I, I think it's whoever the change makers are, whether it's a business, whether it's a school, whoever it is that has the opportunity to work with that individual. I just think we need to, I think we need to try harder. I think we need to put things in place, whether it's the job that Kirks is doing or the job that we're in the process of doing. We need to put, we need to have more patience, knowing that, knowing that we're dealing with a situation that is, is not necessarily good, with, with that individual that is not motivated. And we need to have more patience to know that we have to try hard with that individual. I have a, we, have an, we had an experience with a sister company of ours. With a, it was a, an expat in, individual. And he quit. He quit because he said we were working him too hard. Um, all right, fair enough. So off he went back to the US. And he called us about two years later and said, I just, I just wanted to let you guys know that when I left you, I went to work for another company. And I am an absolute rock star at this company because everything that I left you for because you were working me too hard is what exactly what they're asking me to do and I am absolutely prepared. So I don't think a lot of people don't actually know. It's kind of like the you know the parent that's tough on their kid. The kid might think that their you know their parent is being unfair but later on in life they say, well you know really I'm really glad that you you beat me when you did because <laughs> it leaves some sense into me a sort of the same principle. And I think as businesses since we have such an opportunity to turn lives around. I think we all need to do a better job of having more patience and putting more energy into those students or young adults who need our assistance. Because I don't think it's good enough to just say, I did my job, you didn't do yours, so off you go. If I could just add, sorry, if I could just add to that as well. I think one of the things that we could do a better job of as a community is um, establishing, we're starting to do that, but establishing more partnerships there's so many initiatives, there's so much willingness out there. Um, there's a government sector that you know, has a, a lot of good um, initiatives and programs in place. There are private sector industries that, that want to help, that want to address some of the issues that we have. Um, there are service clubs that have wonderful programs. But sometimes some of the things that we see is that there are so many different um, factions that are working towards the same thing. And if we could start to talk more, mm -hmm. if we could start to have more collaboration between all of those efforts, um, I think we really could achieve more if we worked together. I just wanted to add, um, in our organization, the Ritz-Carlton, uh, the lifelong learning, it has to take place. We schedule training and we're all required to attend. We have um, problem solving. We have anticipation of guest needs. We have, you know, um, service type of classes. When our um, systems change, everyone who's impacted by that system change has to learn about it. So on a very small level, we're pulling people along with us. But the <coughs> superstars are the ones that are out front saying, can I be involved in that change? Um, but I, I do think every organization pulls people with them. And how you make the switch, it really starts very young or when something happens in your life where you realize it's now or nothing. But we do have those people in every organization who decide to quit learning, quit trying, but stay in the job. We call them quit and stay. We, they're in there, they're bottlenecks, and we continue to work with them until we make the decision they do need to leave in order for us to effectively move forward.
Thank you. We're out of time, and I know Asko and others had some questions, so I'm going to ask our panel to, to be available over coffee, if that's okay, um, mm -hmm. to answer any further questions. And thank you very much, panel. A great job, great insights. Thank you. Thank you.